Hey, everybody. Absolutely stunning news over here this week. We have a video version of this week's episode available on our Patreon, which is patreon.com slash late night. Go over there, sign up at any tier, and you'll have access to it. Once again, that's patreon.com slash late night. Now, enjoy the show. I just got a text from Rachel, Audrey, just now, quote, I love having grown up friends because they can buy me stuff. (laughs) Honestly, I very much agree with that. I've been dating someone who has a salary job Mm -hmm. and just every time they take me out, they're like, you want to, I'll buy you food. And I'm like, oh, mm." and they take me to like a nice place. And I'm like, oh, a little food. Very nice. What nice places have you uh, been to so far? Oh my God. And specifically, how much did it cost? (laughs) Itemized bill. LA prices. Oh my God. $8 coffee, $11 like sandwich. It's it's nuts. God forbid a cocktail, which is like $17. $17 for a cocktail. It's ridiculous. If I find like a sub $10 beer, just a Pilsner, I'm jumping for joy. So I was in Westwood uh, yesterday. There was a place called Falafel that sells, guess what? Falafels. Falafels. But they sell falafel sandwiches, like in a pita, that cost $4. What? And they're no. fucking big. No. Yes. Hog. Four dollars. Stuff like that, it just makes me think that everything else is scamming us. I'm just like, you can right. do this for this. It is because they are scamming us. I go on Zillow so I can look at homes and fantasize oh, yes. about one day owning a home. And I always look at the ones in LA because they're just right here. And I'm like, wow, this is extravagant. Mm. Who would live here? Oh, it sucks. It sucks real bad. And then I like look anywhere else in the country and it's like, oh, right, right, right. LA is a stupid, stupid town. Yeah, it's ridiculous. I went from paying four twenty nice um, dollars a month nice in indeed, Savannah, yes. Georgia, where Leighton and I met. Oh, you met in Savannah? Okay, yeah, cool. Did. Oh, yeah. we have a fun meeting story. Oh, I want to hear that. But it'll let, it'll finish this, chaos. and then we'll get we'll get to <laughs> it that. Is, yeah. um, and I pay it like eleven hundred dollars now for rent, which I have like a half unit. It's nice, you know. I have a little like tattoo studio in my house and everything. Oh, that's so, cool. So you which is which yeah, is yeah. pretty good, but it's still just like mm, we had like a you know whole house with multiple like living rooms and a huge kitchen. And a sunroom and had like a big, beautiful place. That was a real spot for a party. Also, the rabbits running around was pretty (laughs) tight. But yeah, you want to tell her meeting story? It's complicated. It is. I knew you from Twitter before we met. And the first time we met in person, I was like, hey, I I followed (laughs) you on Twitter. And you seemed like you were in a hurry or something and you were very agitated. So you were kind of like, I thought that I had offended you somehow by saying that I'd found you on the internet. Oh my God. (laughs) Yeah. The thing is, no one follows me on Twitter. Like up until like this year, I have not had well, any internet Well, that's about to following. change because I'm going to follow you right now. <laughs> you can follow me at local bird mom at Insta on local Instagram. Bird local mom. bird mom on Twitter. Art. It's a little more unhinged. Local bird mom. No, oh, I spelled bird wrong. It's hard if you spell bird wrong. You're not going to find me. You might find someone else. The Twitter's a little less hinged, I would say. Um, <laughs> well, that's it's Twitter. It might be unhinged, but the Instagram, okay. that's where it's at. That's well, I have stuff, just baby. followed you. Followed by Fern and Sean Layton Gray. Oh, heck yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I think I was just floored by that. I probably had like, what, maybe 100 followers on Twitter. And I was just like, why are you following me? I think I found you through our mutual friend and also tattooer, Lauren. And oh. I remember the first time that I saw your paintings, it was like birds. But when I saw it, I thought that it was like an actual old <gasps> painting. That was my like huge poly piece where I was like processing a bunch. Like I went through like three different breakups um, <laughs> at like literally within a week, which is like fun polyamory things. And I did do probably one of the best paintings I've ever done of like <laughs> this like parrot holding these like little feathers and then these like dove and, and crow. Yeah. It's beautiful. Yeah. Also your meat. Mm, the shmeat. Mm. Oh, tell, tell me about your meat. <laughs> so my meat tends to be a little glistening. Mm-hmm. As it should be. I, I do tend you to. You gotta have a wet meat. You gotta have some wet meat. Um, and your her piece. Oh, the her piece. Those were like too. the first three things I saw from you and then I hit you with that <laughs> fat follow. Bam. <laughs> then it was on, huh? Yeah. Well, it wasn't on until... What happened first? So I dated a person. We broke up. Then months later, I'm going to a party. It wasn't a party. It was the um, illustration meetup. 
Right. At that coffee shop. Yeah. God, this is such a cohesive story. I love it. Because Lena and I went to school at the same time. Yes. And this is at SCAD? At SCAD. Yes. Okay. yes. I was an illustration major and you were sequential, right? <laughs> Yeah, isn't Barely. that funny? <laughs> yeah. that, that means that Barely. means comics, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. sequential yeah. arts. That's what I figured. And they were in the same building, Haymans. Yeah. Haymans, yeah, it used to be an old hospital. I didn't know that it was a hospital. That makes so much sense. Yeah, <laughs> that's why it's creepy. Yeah, very underfunded as well. Very large program, not enough money. We didn't have a color printer. It was very sad. At SCAD. At SCAD, which is pretty well off, the school or no? Uh, mm. Paula Wallace is mm. for sure. Is that a person or a school? She's the president. Okay. Yeah. Got it. So therefore, the school must be pretty cheap to go to, of course, right? It, Very yeah. affordable. What SCAD does is it undercuts a lot of the other private art schools, especially on the East Coast. Oh, I see. Because they're nuts generally, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. It's like, you know, like $50,000 a right. year. And right. so I think SCAD is like, what, $35,000 a year? Well, that's significant, actually. Yeah. That's cheaper than yeah. I thought it was going to be like 50, 60. Yeah. And also really easy to get scholarships too, at least in my experience. Really? Because they're trying really hard to recruit freshmen and they have a lot of stuff for freshmen. Very oh. fancy dorm and like, ooh, <laughs> come <laughs> check it out. We have a nap pod in the a student nap- center. Wow. And then the moment you get out of being a freshman, they're just like, fuck you. <laughs> I think literally while I was there, they took an entire upperclassman dorm and just a month before the quarter started, just kicked everyone out. <laughs> and then we're like, yeah, these are freshman dorms now. And wow. then they were like, go F yourself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The animation building is a really fun windowless <laughs> prison that just has sleep deprived students crammed on every floor. Mm-hmm. I vomited in there once. Wow, why? <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> this that was right be- makes it a better story. <laughs> this was right before I dropped out for mental health issues. Mm-hmm. So for the first time. Against Brent's advice. <laughs> yeah, that was a different thing. Oh, what a wonderful time just thinking oh about gosh. vomiting in Montgomery Hall. Wow. Anyway, I forget the chronology, but we matched on Tinder, which I think was after... You messaged me asking if it was chill that this person that you were dating, that I had dated, if it was chill if we were at the same space. That's a very kind request. I was so touched What by a it. nice thing to ask. It wasn't even that the person that you had dated was coming to the thing. I was just like, hey, I'm seeing this person, and I've heard that like things ended rockily. And so I was like, <laughs> are you... <laughs> Can you tell this story? No. No. Okay. No. <laughs> Rockley is a bit of a overstatement. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> I feel like it's an understatement. I guess. It sounds more like a question than a statement. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, so we match on Tinder. Weirdly, we match on Tinder like while you're in... Um, Wilmington? Yeah. And yeah. then we started talking and we got really close. And then I we became friends like while you were like middle of dream daddy yeah I say. you were still mm-hmm. in th- mm-hmm. and then you moved back to savannah and we started hanging out yeah because i think it was over like a christmas break mm. this was this was around the time that i was on tinder and the minions underwear story happened oh, and yes. i still the cannot tell on the show oh, yeah minions underwear story i love having like my best story is one that i can't say on the show so many of your best patreon ones are like only. That. <laughs> so true we'll tell that story on patreon <laughs> yeah oh, that's God. a that was a yes yeah Anyway, so then now we're friends. You make a lot of friends on Gay Tinder. <laughs> yes. Um, it's a very, very much open-ended journey into meeting someone and being like, ah, really? the joke is that you never know if you're on a date and you'll be on like three dates in <laughs> and you'll be like, um, uh, is, is this a date? I just like, I thought about kissing you last time and uh, I didn't, but. And also yeah. in Savannah, that community is real. Real small. Real <laughs> tiny. <laughs> and so it's pretty much coincidence that you're both out here now. Who came out here first? Lady. That was me. And then you, did you graduate from SCAD? I had already graduated when we met. I'm I'm a little oh, bit, I'm 27. Yeah. You're 20, so I'm gotcha. a little older than Leighton. Yeah, I have no idea what that's like. <laughs> <laughs> so I was in Savannah for a little while after I graduated school. Mm-hmm. And I was doing like some mural work. I was a model for the school. I was doing some illustration stuff. And just none of it was really working out. And Savannah's kind of a hard city to live in, especially like being a trans lady in the South has its own fun caveats. Yes, I um, <laughs> But Savannah was great. I love like the queer community down there and it was lovely. But I went back home to D.C. and then conveniently 
November 2019. Uh, I don't know if you knew, know anything fun that happened in the 2020s, but the uh, mm, mm, <laughs> pandemic started. Right. Uh, and so I kind of got stuck at home when it was supposed to be a hop. It turned into a hop, skip, and a jump. So. Wow. But yeah, I was deciding if I wanted to go to New York or L.A. because those are two big tattoo cities. Mm -hmm. um, and I sort of had some connections in both. Had you been to either? I have been to New York. I'd visited Layton in 2018. Mm -hmm. um, 2018. Isn't that crazy? Wow. I still have the notes that you left me on my fridge. Oh, my God. Aww. That's so gay. <laughs> I know, right? Because <laughs> um, you pressed that little clover for me. Oh, yeah. I, did. I found a four-leaf clover. Aww. Um like smoked weed with like a dude in a park. It was weird. I also, Classic LA experience. Get high and find clovers. I got stood up on a yes. date by another trans girl. Here. Here in 2018. And we ended up following each other on Instagram. And I have now reconnected with that person. Mm -hmm. And we're giving each other tattoos. It's great. That's cool. That's awesome. <laughs> That's Very adorable. fun little journey. But yeah, so I had visited then, but I didn't really know. And then I got offered a job out here, which did not work out as intended. But um, I... <laughs> <laughs> Can you say what that job... I, I, was? I, I got offered a spot at a shop, which is rare. It's hard to break into the tattoo industry, especially as a self-taught tattoo artist mm -hmm. um, and especially being a hand-poked tattoo artist. And I got offered a job. And then a couple of months into that, I figured out kind of why, because they were finding very easily um, new entries into the tattoo oh, world. people that could take advantage of. Yeah, exactly. Yes, okay. Exactly. Very girl boss capitalism. Mm -hmm. I won't say what it is because I am genuinely scared of them uh, suing me. <laughs> yeah, hey, fair enough. Yeah, because they were so cool to you. They were so the cool to me. They were so great and to so me. cool to yeah, everybody cool else. Cool people are going to be cool. Yeah. That's yeah. the whole theme of this podcast. Taking Let's all your money cool. and being weird to your trans clients. It's great. We love it. Uh, safe spaces, right? Yes, of course. <laughs> Capitalistic safe spaces. <laughs> So you started your own place. Yeah, I started my own place and I have been guessing around. There's a wider tattoo community, which that shop I was at was somewhat separated from, has like offered me spaces at all these cool places. Oh, and, that's awesome. you know, I've been guesting around. Guesting is tattooing at a shop for maybe a week or a couple of days. So will you tell how you initially started tattooing? Well, you know what? Why don't we introduce the show? Oh, here. yes. Uh, so everybody, this is late night here. And now I'll, I'll play the camera. Sorry, I forgot we're recording this. Hopefully I hit record. Looks like it's recording. Um, <laughs> everybody, this is late night with Brian Wecht over here, literally across from me. For once. For once is Leighton Gray. Hey, Crowd that's applause. me. The, the person who just spoke was Brian Wecht. Yeah, let I'm me do my patented finger guns. Bang, 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 bang. And I'm so excited to ask you this question, oh mystery guest. Oh would you care to introduce yourself? <laughs> I've been waiting for so long. My name is Allison Fry, or Aspen Fry, as many people in LA know me. I go by both. I actually have three names, but the third one is secret. It's not a secret. It's on my Instagram. Um, <laughs> uh, I am one of Layton's, honestly, you're like one of my oldest friends that I'm like still actively around at yeah. this point. We've known each other like... Five, six years? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, something like that. I'm a tattoo artist. I'm a hand poke tattoo artist in LA. Yeah. I don't know what else. I mean, I think that's that's that's, that's great. That's yeah. perfect. Yeah, late late. That's more been, than we usually get from yes, for sure. Guests. It's, it's usually that was, that just their name. <laughs> shockingly yeah. like informative compared to what we're used to here. Yeah. Well, also we foster that of <laughs> no, not taking this seriously at all. And we always forget to tell people that they're going to introduce themselves. Some people consider it downright unprofessional, to which I'm like, hell yeah, it is. <laughs> So the fun fact is that I, I think I have listened to just about every episode of this podcast. No. Uh, yeah. Wow. Okay. I, uh, so you, yeah. you get it. You know, I love Leighton a lot and I would listen to it because I missed her and it was fun. And also it's a great time and you're both hilarious well, and your you. guests are unhinged and not oh, well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I know all your secrets. Don't try and trick oh, me. Tell me um, a secret about myself. <sighs> They're too dark. Yeah, no, believe me. I can't, I can't bring them up. Yeah. They come to me in visions at night. <laughs> Nightmares. Nightmares. <laughs> uh, yeah, you, you have notes. I have notes. Can you do a podcast rescue oh my on God. us and give us comments? Okay. This is terrible. So, no, no, I really want to know this. What would you change? Oh, God. It doesn't have to be something that you dislike. It might just be time for a change. Like how we tried to change the title of the What's Poppin' segment. Until Leighton shoehorned it back into <laughs> what's popping. You're putting but this on me. I, I'm really, I am, but 100% accurately. 
I did like BBLBing. Oh, the BLB B- corner. B- oh, BLBing, not BBLBing. BBLBing. <laughs> I like it because it's really rolls off the tongue. Yeah. BBW adjacent. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> yep. Oh no! Do you know what one of the author acronyms on one of my science papers was? BBBW. <laughs> Incredible. Which I was. It was. I was a proud. Have you all seen? There's like a classic Reddit comment thread where this guy went on to r slash bbw thinking that it was a barbecuing subreddit and was asking tips on smoking brisket. I have seen this or yes, something. It's great. And yeah. then somebody explained it, and he just responded, "Oh, y'all have fun now." <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of fun acronyms. Oh yes, My- I love cognitive behavioral therapy. <laughs> <laughs> I have a query. Yes, please. Um, So in your music, Mm -hmm. there's a lot of butt stuff. There's a lot of butt stuff. Do you know about poppers? I do know about poppers. You do know about, because we were talking to Jarek, and Jarek did not know about poppers. Oh, yeah. Um, Kept calling them poggers. I think, I I mean, people were doing poppers in like the 70s, Yeah. if not before. It's our history. Yeah. So, (laughs) yeah. No, I mean... I would assume most people know what poppers are, but I guess that's I've, not I've true. I've been thinking it's been rattling around my head. I feel like they are depicted and discussed in popular media. Are they? I think they are. Are there poppers? I is know. That, for is a, that I know for what's popping? Is what? Oh wow! It's what's popper is. Like, <laughs> that's what it is. This episode. So one thing I can think of offhand is they were definitely in that behind the candelabra, the Michael Douglas Liberace movie. Mm. They were definitely in that. That's pretty mainstream. Michael Douglas played. Liberace. And he crushed it. Did he? It was great. It's a Soderbergh. You didn't know about this? No. Soderbergh directed a a kind of a biopic of Liberace with, was it Matt Damon? Was it Michael Douglas and Matt Damon? Well, anyway, Scott Bakula is in it briefly, which was my favorite part. But yeah, I thought it was a great movie. All right. Yeah. (laughs) I believe you. God, Michael Douglas. Is he good? What's Uh, he doing lately? Oh, he was um, Hank Pym. Of course, in the Ant Man movies, uh, he's active. He's around. He's old though. Okay, and he's married fair. to Catherine Zeta Jones. Oh, don't you remember? Didn't he get throat cancer from going down on her or something? <laughs> what? That is Hold one on. one of the life. more bizarre. I believe statements that's true. You've ever made on this show. I want to fact check, like okay, right here, on. right now. I'm going to do it right now. Meanwhile, I'm going to talk about how wild it is that there are two different movies where Michael Douglas Michael seduces very Douglas hot women and like they try to kill him. Like, how did he get cast in both? I'm going to read you an article now from 2013. Title of this article is. Michael Douglas blames his cancer on oral sex. Oh, my God. That's literally the Sopranos line of cunnilingus and psychiatry brought us to this. Oh, my God. This is a quote. Quote, without wanting to get too specific, this particular cancer is caused by HPV, which actually comes about from cunnilingus. Douglas, 68, told the British newspaper The Guardian. He added that he has had real success beating back the tumor with chemotherapy. So I think he's fine now. I guess that makes sense. Good He's also, by the way perhaps relevantly, a longtime smoker. (laughs) Ah, definitely the cunnilingus then. That's hilarious. Oh my God. No, 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 no. Not not the smoking. No, not the smoking. Doctors tell you the smoking. It's because I eat too much pussy. (laughs) I'm just slobbering on that knob. So much puss. (laughs) He's Michael Douglas. Look, it's not implausible. He's a big time Hollywood star. Can I see what Michael Douglas looks like? I don't know what he looks like. Now or? or Falling down. At any point. Basic instinct. Nope. Michael, I Have mean, you seen Basic Instinct? Because that's a real... So, Leighton, I don't know if you know this, but I've been thinking about it a lot. But we are, in fact, so often polar opposites. I have seen, like, five movies. Okay, this is Michael Douglas. Like, that prime, is, that is nothing. Prime that's Michael a cardboard Douglas. face here's, to me. <laughs> uh, here's relatively recent Michael Douglas. On the right? Yeah, the old guy. The old guy. No. God, I no? am so disconnected that's great. from okay. culture. But you're so connected to parts of culture that I am not. Like, I feel like you know way more music and art stuff. Nope. I know like <laughs> I know like 10 bands. Wait, so what movies do you like? I know you really like Annihilation. Mm. You had spicy words about the book that I think are completely spot on. The book is just bad. It is just a bad book. I love it in concept. I love it in theory. But it is just, it's so bad. Is this, it this is Jeff like Vandermeer? Is that right? It's Jeff yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then the sequel, there's three of them, but I read half of the second one. It was just like... So I read his most recent, A Peculiar Peril, which I did not like at all. It's kind of like a YA Mm. book. 
it's really fucking long. It's like mm. this big. And the idea is cool. It's a bit like a bunch of like interdimensional doors, a little bit of steampunk kind of thing going on. Napoleon is a head in a jar that's kind of running part of the sorcerer that's trying to take over the world sort of thing. Some interesting ideas, but it was a real slog yeah. to get through. The first book of Annihilation was like the same thing where it's just, this is really cool in theory and there's like neat bits, but it's just like, it's not a fun read and it's not, yeah. not a fun read in a cool way. That's exactly how I felt about A Peculiar Pearl. But people love these books, right? I've heard people say that they love these. So the thing is, I feel like, oh God, this makes me sound so old. There is a Believe certain me. like Don't worry about it. threshold for weirdness that people have not broached. And that these are pretty approachable weirdnesses. Mm -hmm. And Annihilation, like the movie, was probably a lot too much for people. But the book is like, mm -hmm. it's a little weird. It's a little like theoretical and abstract. Yeah. I'm interested in what you just said, because I think you're right. When you said there's a weirdness, are you talking about subject or stylistic or both? Both. The weirdness of the writing, because it's all written in the first person in the form of these journal entries, mm -hmm. I think that throws people off. They're just like, ooh, a new thing. Nobody gets names. Nobody gets names. Everyone okay. gets titles, which is just, you know, right. interesting. Yeah. It sort of sure. hangs itself on all of these sort of peculiarities, but none of them have very much substance. Mm -hmm. And I think there is, you know, somewhere deep in the notes of this book is probably a cool concept and a cool, like, mm -hmm. thesis of it. But, you know, like so many other interesting things, like the key to the metaphor, the key to the sort of understanding of why any of this has come to our world, not in theory, but just the book itself. Mm -hmm. It's just not there. And had the book elaborated on any of the characters or done anything remotely interesting or like, I don't know if Vandermeer has ever witnessed women interacting with each oh my other. God. <laughs> you know, if you want weird prose, weird subject, like Faulkner or Joyce are doing this over 100 years ago in some sense, right? If you go with the real like literary shit, I'm not saying that's the Oh, like Joyce's all. letters to his wife? Are they terrible? Wait. What you know about this? I right? don't. I don't know about this. <laughs> James Joyce has some very interesting things that he is into sexually, mm -hmm. and there is a large volume of very graphic letters oh, that yeah, he. I've, right, I've heard about this. Yes, where yeah. he's pretty clear about you what could he wants. Describe him as an ass man <laughs> to a degree. <laughs> anyway, I was hoping that one would slide under, and I wouldn't have to <laughs> explain it. He did write Finnegan's butt. <laughs> God tier bit. Have you Thank ever read you. Finnegan's Week? You know what? I never have. Actually, I've not even read Ulysses, although I've started it a couple times. But Finnegan's Wake, as I understand it, is another level up of difficult from Ulysses. And honestly, I think my understanding about Ulysses is it's people say it's really hard, but it's not. That might just be because people are not smart. But I think that ties back into the like weirdness tolerance where people's weirdness tolerance is so low that if you go even an inch beyond that, they're like, whoa, were they on acid when they made this? hundred percent with yeah. literally everything. If you watch Doctor Strange and you're like, dude, that's fucked up. Oh my yeah. God. It's like, no, what are you doing? That's because you haven't seen anything, right? And that, that's, yeah. an, that's an acceptable thing to say if you're a kid. But once you get to, whatever, adulthood, well into adulthood, and you think that's the most outre shit you've ever seen, probably you haven't seen that much. And I feel like it's very easy to go that route. There's like, so totally. much. It's the easiest to go that route. And there's right? so much yeah. bland media. But I think the important thing of the Annihilation is that it's in that sweet spot where it's not too weird that it alienates people. Right, that's right. And especially the film is just, you know, straight up a horror movie, but it's sort of you yeah, know, yeah. existential. But greater point of the book is not there, but whatever greater point was in the book is just totally sloughed off for the uh, movie. And mm -hmm. just so all of that creates this very like entryable thing. And they're like, whoa, this is the best thing I've ever written because it's not a Marvel movie. Kind right, of thing. right, right. Yeah. I agree with that. Yeah. Oh God. I'll say the thing that I'm going to say, mm. but watching like, let's say uh -oh. WandaVision uh -huh. and mm. being like, this is so deep. Mm. I say about a thing I haven't watched. It's very good. I liked WandaVision a lot. I believe Was it. Was it deep? It was not deep. I think, I mean, this is once again the thing where I don't have an issue with the text. I have an issue with the way that people respond to a text, but it's really none of my fucking business as are most opinions that I have. And moreover, it might be deep as a starter thing. Like, I don't want to cast aspersions on people who just want to enjoy 
a thing or who really connect to a thing. No, it's for sure. That I'm like, I'm going to listen to the Cannibal Holocaust soundtrack for fun. <laughs> like, I'm just a douchebag. So really, who am I to? Fair. But I think it's also, the thing I struggle to do is to forgive people who are just starting out. Like, you know, that might be deep if you're inexperienced or naive or whatever. It's not even a value judgment. It's just like you kind of got to start somewhere. And maybe that's your first taste. And maybe that's as far as you go and you're happy with it. I think that's totally, totally fine. The other thing that was really dumb about WandaVision is that stupid grief line that went all over social media. Do you remember this? Oh, yeah. I feel like every like Marvel movie and Marvel esque movie has one of those lines that people are like, well, this makes it art. And this like, shot that's should right. be taught in film yeah, school. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> no, come on. Like, it's not even that it was a bad line. It just, someone made a huge statement about it. What was it? It was like, this is the most beautiful line mm. in TV history or something. Mm. Yeah. It's like, no, it's not. It's yeah. like assigning superlatives to things. And I will dislike media because of the reaction to it. And I think that's, as we've discussed recently, like really unfair Yes, that's But that, that's also, right. I think it's fine to have unfair opinions. Just all, all it's, opinions it depends on what you do with to them. To some extent, yeah. I also think that it's hard when so much of our media is run by like massive monopolies sure. and your reaction to it is curated. You yes, know? that's 100% true. And, yeah. and there are like influencers that are sponsored by Disney to be like pushing these sort of like narratives of it. That's and right. this sounds somewhat conspiratorial. No, but it's true. It's they just what's happening. It. Yeah, it's yeah. true. And so I think the critique, you know, everyone's like, oh, enjoy things. Marvel is fine. It's fun. And I'm like, yes, it's fun. It's great. It's just, why is like 80% of our media from one monopoly? That's yeah, it the sucks. problem. Marvel movies are great. They're I, fine. I enjoy them. Yeah, I want like great. 1% of the film catalog of the world to be Marvel movies. Totally. And it's like 80%. Right Once now. again, yeah, yeah. you go an inch above the weirdness line, or let's just say representation line like yes more female war criminals <laughs> <laughs> my favorite thing was in the um in the call of duty black ops you could like black out your gender and they were like you can be non-binary in the vietnam war and it's like oh yeah they're like problem solved check that box all done <laughs> got them oh more than two women talk to each other i feel like the bechdel test like just became not useful anymore of just like well we did it kids we got the corporate feminism what would the Wechdel test be? <laughs> Can you shoehorn a butt joke into daily life? Yeah. It, it, Does it, this movie volume? contain shoehorned butt jokes that are inappropriate uh, yes. to the conversation? Sorry, non sequiturs. That's what I'm looking for. Mm-hmm. Maybe yeah. that's it. Wechdel test. A Wechdel test. Or if you yeah. can have a joke land so flat that it causes silence and a shift in the conversation. Oh, that's a good, yes. That's, <laughs> mm, I like that. You that, got yes. options there. So that's my move. You can combine both do. of them to create be. a. a Double wecked? Yes. Mm, like a double jeopardy. There's nothing better than a good silence after a joke you thought was really <laughs> funny. Oh, I mean, that's, that's like so half good. the podcast. That's my happy place. Your okay. child enjoys it. Well, I was going to say, it's called being a parent for me right now. Oh, I got her to laugh oh. uh, about, it was like a month ago. <laughs> <laughs> this was three years ago. <laughs> but I remember what it was because Rachel was like, wow, you got one over on her, huh? <laughs> Here was the joke. Ooh. What's strong and green? What? Muscle sprouts. What are muscle sprouts? It's like Brussels sprouts, but muscly. Anyway, it made my seven-year-old laugh. That's a good joke. That's a good joke right there. It's a good joke right there. I love every single time we do an in-person thing, you just amp that up and then point to the camera. That's right. We got the camera. This is why you get on the Patreon I am notorious for jokes flying over my head, so I feel like that's a better joke than I gave that question. It's a far. great joke, is what it is. As you noticed, when I told it, Leighton cracked up. She thought it was hilarious. She lost yes. her mind. I feel like I had the hardest cackle that I've had on record. <laughs> Do you know which one I'm talking about? Because it was uh, in the jury thing. The Sopranos one? Yeah. No, I don't know what you're talking about. It was when I made a crack about many saints of Newark... Like, does Junior go up to our boy Soprano and be like, uh, you never had the makings of a varsity athlete? And then oh, Jory yeah. says, that's what the movie is about. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Right. Yes. You know what? It's funny. I did just hear that. That got you. It was hard. That broke the sound barrier. Anyway, I want to circle back around to why I mentioned Annihilation, because what movies do you really love? Oh. <laughs> yes. Good question. Wait, will you talk about The English Patient? 
don't know. Wait, the patient or the movie? I don't mean to out you oh with English patient. Wait, oh, is the English patient a sex move? No. <laughs> so okay. the English patient is a book. You have to admit that'd be a great name for a sex move, though, right? <laughs> <laughs> This is well, funnier when d- I are you familiar okay. with the plot? <laughs> so, you know, I saw the movie, but it was a long time ago. So, I believe that the movie, I've only watched half of the like, what, three hour long it's movie? It's really long, yeah. Is it Ray Fiennes? Is that Liam Neeson? Yeah. Which one? I know it's Ray guys Fiennes. Okay, got it. And Willem Dafoe. Willem Dafoe is the thumbless thief. Oh, shit. I have no memory of him being in that. Yeah. But anyway, I read The English Patient when I was 14. Okay. Um, it's a big, thick book. And I read it. And Dune, mostly on the toilet, because mm-hmm. I don't know, 14 year olds poop a lot. Sure. Um, True. So it is a postmodernist meditation on death and grief and the passing of people. And at what point do we ourselves become non existent? Is it after death? Is it before we die? Other things like that. This culminates in a. <laughs> Don't. <laughs> I can't talk about it? Don't. I'm sorry that I brought it. You brought this up. I'm sorry. Oh, my God. If you want to know the plot of The English Patient and the natural extrapolation of what you're describing, then go read the Wikipedia or wow. whatever. This was what? the very <laughs> definition of anticlimax, where you <laughs> pimped her into telling a story and then immediately said, we can't tell that story. And it got just to the most interesting part. Which, you know what? I'm proud of you for doing, because it's an awesome move. <laughs> it's comedic edging. <laughs> That's exactly what it is. <laughs> yeah. Tell it, and we'll cut it out if we have to. Say it, it's, and we'll see how you feel. So the culmination of this is that, you know, there's a romance. There's sort of a past that is in North Africa, and there's a present, which is post-World War One, I, I think? Where there's, like, a nurse taking care of the English patient, and, like, this bomb diffuser comes in, and he's, like, you know, always on the brink of death, and she's given up her life for this person, so she's functionally dead, and the dude's burnt up, like, mm-hmm. the English patient is all burnt, and so he's dying, and the thief with no thumbs can't be a thief, so he's dead, all this stuff. So, and then we go to the past, where the English patient, and he falls in love with this woman. And they go out into the desert, and he has to leave her in the desert, and she dies in the desert. Okay. And so he comes back, and he uh, unwraps. I think I see where this is going. <laughs> okay, yes. Um, and nature takes its course. Nature takes its course, and it is an achingly beautiful meditation on where people leave us and at which point they are gone and i kind of hate the author for making it beautiful and i'm like god god damn it you had to make that pretty ain't that good art though this is going off the rest this whole thing is great (laughs) i I think we can keep that i think that's fine sure yeah it's Uh, i mean it's not like we're endorsing desert everybody (laughs) To, to be very clear it is the official position of late night that Specifically, desert necrophilia is bad. <laughs> All right. So All no, other forms no, of necrophilia I, we're not is fine. We're not commenting on the other stuff, but desert oh, necrophilia God. is bad, and that is the official podcast position. We've gone from child murder bad to this <laughs> yes. 100 episodes yeah. in, so that's great. That's, yeah. So, why did you want me to freak that out, Layton? I asked because it's a thing that you really like, and I. I <laughs> And I, I didn't go further than that mentally, as is always oh, the case God. on this show. So I feel like I dug a hole in the desert. It was funny. The last couple of months, I've had a book on my bedside table, which is The English Patient, and another one on top of that, which is Cannibalism in Nature. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so, Really? You know, Tell me about that. I did not read it. I need to return oh. to the library. It's so it's late. It's like, like animals. Animal yeah, cannibalism. Yeah. Like the natural, the natural, like a perfectly natural habit. But those two books stacked up next to each other with the right knowledge um, can look quite scary. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I actually think that's a really fun choice of you. <laughs> You know, I'm a catch. Um, I, I like this you are. this general idea of what else do you love? Gosh, my favorite band is Mothers. Yeah, I don't know them. Very tender. I don't think Very I know them. Tender. Art rock band, which is fronted by Christine Leshber. And I really think I remember interviews where they're sort of saying that like, oh, it's Christine Leshber's band, but we sort of like help her create yeah. it. For our yacht rock uh, jazz fusioners. It's like the Rippingtons with Russ Freeman. So you know how every <laughs> Rippingtons <laughs> album is featuring Russ Freeman? Well, it's exactly like <laughs> Can that. we go one episode without mentioning the Rippingtons? No, we cannot. Because, you see, here's the deal. The Rippingtons logo, their mascot is this Jesus. cat. Anyway, so Mothers, <laughs> on the last thing, we were talking about, like, the wavery voice. Yes. Very much that. 
Oh, yeah, I like that. A very poetic Big Thief and Adrian Lenker. Adrian Lenker is the singer of in Big Thief. Mm -hmm. um, a little more similar that other people might know. Mothers is out of Athens, Georgia. Mm. Very just like beautiful, poetic, very interesting like shifts in well, the cool. music, which yeah. I don't know enough about music. I'm more of a lyrics gal, which is always a disconnect with me and Leighton because I'm yeah. like, listen to the song. And she's like, oh, it's great. And I'm like, yeah, this part was great. The, so poetic. And she's like, this, yeah, I, I'm with Leighton. This <laughs> yeah. is how I listen to music the, the Leighton way, which is I kind of miss lyrics most of the time. I will know and sing this song for 10 years, but I'm just mumbling mm. uh, what the words sound like. I'm like, oh, that's what that yes, song I is Yes, I do that about. exact same thing. What's your opinion on Dylan? Who's Dylan? Bob Dylan. I've you, never listened to Bob Dylan. I don't give a single shit about Bob Dylan, and people love Bob Dylan, and I've never understood why. Is Bob Dylan the This Machine Kills Fascist guy? No, that's uh, Guthrie. Okay. Yeah, I I don't think I've ever Bob listened Dylan to Bob Dylan. Bob Dylan is blowing in the wind. Nope. Uh, what else <laughs> did Bob Dylan? piss so many Dylan? people off. <laughs> yeah, it's, I mean, a million famous songs. Big folky in the 60s. I love some folk. I'm more of a folk punk girl, mm -hmm. um, but... Leighton saying that I know music. Very untrue. I don't know. You make a fire playlist. I do make, but it's the same like 10 bands. I only make playlists with the same 10 bands. So one of us is going to have to change. <laughs> <laughs> I've actually started like a mega playlist where I have oh. my clients give me a song That's after a I tattoo them. That's a great idea. Yeah. What a great idea. What is like the best song that you've gotten out of that practice? Probably Trader Joe's by Jungle Pussy. Um, Ooh. <laughs> uh, which is a banger. And I tattooed two people that day. One of them gave me that song, and the other gave me a song from the Legally Blonde musical. <laughs> oh, yes. My, my niece is very into this. Oh. Yeah. So those were two good ones. I keep forgetting to ask people, and then I ask people on Instagram like, with a little question. I'm like, oh, I keep forgetting to ask people. Give me one of those songs. And then I forget to write down the songs, and then the story goes away, and then I can't get it again. And then I'm like, oh. <laughs> Okay, other movies that are not Annihilation, of your five movies that you like. You know, I love a good Ghibli, Princess Mononoke. I love Porco Rosso. Oh, I haven't um, seen that one. It's When Pigs Fly, and it's okay. just a bunch of puns, <laughs> which it's terrific. And, you know, post-World War I, fascism is rising, and mm -hmm. he's a pig that flies. Cool. Pirates. Pirates. Oh, to be a pig that flies. Oh, to be a pig that flies. <laughs> we just recently watched uh, My Neighbor Totoro mm. with Audrey for the first time, and she loved it. Of course. It's a good age for that movie. We're going to wait on Spirited Away mm. a little bit, but <gasps> yeah, because it's scary. great, but yeah. it's scary. That it's scared like, a lot of kids when it first yeah. came out. We went to theaters and it was like, this is too much. It's too much, I think, for her. She gets easily scared. Yeah. Oh, this is why you should jump straight into Princess Mononoke. Yeah. Mm. See, I feel like Princess Mononoke is more violent, but it's less scary. Yeah, that's fair. The thing that I think specifically would scare her about Spirited Away is not just the imagery, but this kid's fucking like yeah. lost and... Good luck. Is he ever going to make it home? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I remember when the parents turned into pigs. That like yes. sad. Yes. Terrifying. No, terrifying. Yeah. It was I, absolutely terrifying. And I was like, I don't know, 20 or something when I saw that. And it was still oh, scary. God. Yeah. Yeah. Also, they're like animated so grotesquely. How's Moving Castle might be. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah, we could yeah. try that one. We did uh, Kiki. Kiki's Grace. And that was a good one. Yeah. And of course, it's, you know, it's a little girl doing stuff and. That's all Audrey ever wants in her media. Nausicaa in the Valley of the Wind is actually. Oh, a I've good been one. curious about that. Yeah, oh, I don't know. So it. good. Okay, um, cool. Absolutely beautiful. Very like grand fantasy a little bit, and so it's very hopeful and very good with you know another female protagonist who's yes. doing great stuff. So I would recommend that one. It's a little violent. There's a little blood, she but it's a little that. more like narrative. It's less like gory. Right. Yeah, she yeah. can handle that. Tattoo. Yeah. Question mark. Will you explain stick and poke for people who maybe don't know? Yes. So stick and poke and hand poke are two versions of kind of the same thing, which is basically just tattooing without a machine. Your hand acts as the machine. And a tattoo needle is made up of a bunch of pins and you mark them by how many pins are at the end. And that makes a bigger or smaller dot. And so with hand poke, you're just doing it a little slower. Um, the machine is making a full line because it goes and it's putting like 80 dots per second or something. But you can be a little more precise, a little rougher. There's a couple of things that I would 
mark as like overall better than a machine. You can get like a nice textural quality to it that is a little harder to do with a tattoo machine. It's also a lot easier to learn. It's like learning how to drive without learning how to become a mechanic because with machines, there's a whole lot of different stuff, you know? And I'm assuming also like an access barrier to entry. Oh, that's a good point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Because you're just buying needles. I attach my needles to a popsicle stick. I wrap it with tape and then put some coban or cohesive bandage to give it a grip so I don't get carpal tunnel or repetitive stress injury. I Mm -hmm. think I've been being yelled at on TikTok about carpal tunnel. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) that's the more general name. Yeah. Yeah, and then you're just going at it. And, that, you know, there's a lot of visual technical stuff about, like, how it's entering the skin and... Elaborate. Ah, uh, so... We, Get technical, <laughs> please. <laughs> oh, Layton, you know me so well. I love getting, like, real gear heady about, like, skin and, Great. and machine it. stuff. It's one of my yes, favorite please. things about you. Please. <laughs> so, uh, we're, when we're tattooing, we're working with three layers of skin. We're working with your epidermis on top. We're working with your dermis after that. And then we're working with your... Hy- Soul. Hy- hyper- yeah. <laughs> yes, right to the bone. Yeah, um, We're actually tattooing the bones. No, the hypodermis has a, has a lot more fat, blood vessels, stuff like that. Your epidermis top layer is like paper thin most of the time, unless mm-hmm. it's like your hands, your feet, or like your elbows or something like that. So we're trying to put ink into the dermis. It's the stable layer. The epidermis flakes off. So if you tattoo there, it's just going to be gone in about a month. So we're trying to put it in the dermis. With a hand poke, you actually have the resistance of the multiple pins of the needle. And so you're actually pushing in. So you're doing it by feel. Okay? Yeah. You, 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 you feel like, it when you're in the right layer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it depends on which, like, let's say I'm using a three, which is three pins versus like a seven. Um, the seven is going to have a lot more resistance, mm-hmm. whereas the three, you have to hold back a little more. But with a machine, goes in like butter. It's just you're holding it back mm-hmm. rather than pushing it in. You must build up these muscles to some extent, right? The pins are really tiny. Mm-hmm. They're like way thinner than like a sewing needle. Like oh, they're okay, really small. You determine gauge by these three numbers, which is kind of backwards because usually it's like zero is the biggest gauge, but 12 is the biggest gauge for tattoo needles. I think you can go up to 14, but no one uses those. That li- means the thickest. Yeah, of each individual pin. Mm-hmm. And so that's 0.35 millimeters. That's still sizable, the biggest, but yeah, the small. Yeah, and then you go to 0.3 and 0.25. Mm-hmm. And the 0.3 and 0.25 are called bug pins because they're as thin as the bug pins that you they do used to for ping like little, your little buggy. Little buggies, yeah. yeah. That's so cute. Yeah, a very cute little moniker. There's a lot of like fun and then grotesque terms. <laughs> and the ink comes through the needle into no. the skin or no? No, no, no. So what's happening is that you are pushing the needle in and it's making a space in your skin and none of the ink is in there at that point. Oh. If you could take away all of the ink from the top, you wouldn't leave a black dot. But when you take it out, it suctions all of the ink into the hole. No, I had no idea. Yeah. Wow. So with hand poke, we're relying on sort of like a fountain pen or like a dip pen. We're relying on the sort of structure of the needles to act as our reservoir of ink. With machine tattooing, you have like this plastic casing around it, which is called your tube or your cartridge, which holds like a bunch of ink. So Mm. with hand poke, I'm like, dipping every couple of like, it, centimeters. It. Do you keep the thing on your hand or do you just kind of have it? No. Like- There's people who have that. It's really dangerous for like needle stick because if you miss it, you just stab yourself with your hand needle. and you don't want to put yeah. it. Yeah. And also like people don't understand is that stretching is really important. You need two hands to tattoo. That sounds bad. I'm sure there's people who tattoo with one hand, but so you need your other hand to stretch. And so I would hate Hmm. to have something on my finger because I wouldn't be able to like do as varied stretches because you need to have the skin as taut as possible. So in like some Polynesian traditions where you're using a um, tapping rake method, Mm -hmm. so you literally have like a rake shape with pins at the end and then a little hammer to tap it, using both hands to do that. So you need other people to stretch the skin for you. Hmm which is, you know, makes it kind of more of a communal act and it's cool. Right. Other than aesthetic preferences, what do you need to know about someone before you start tattooing them? Yeah, so we give everyone a consent sheet, which Mm -hmm. has, you know, some pretty basic medical questions. So we need to know, a big one that people might not know is diabetes can cause some issues with tattoo healing, can make them like take a really long time to heal, which is way more prone to infection. And so it's always good to be aware of that and just, you know, maybe do lighter sessions. Mm -hmm. You don't want to have like a heavy black work piece and like right, a right, whole right. big black circle and then you have an open wound for, you know, three weeks and yeah, then yeah. you get infected, stuff like that. Um, and just like various like, are you, you know, 
prone to excessive bleeding, do have skin conditions, usually skin conditions. Allergies, is that relevant? Yeah. So depending on what you use, I use things with aloe, some things with lavender, some people use latex gloves, I don't. Um, Certain inks can have allergens in them, although the most common allergy is is to red ink. And back in the day, like... You, you had tattoo guys like going down to the pigment shop and they would like right. learn which pigments could go in people's skin yeah, yeah, yeah. by like which people came back with infections right. and stuff. So Whoa. is the red, is it the same sort of thing with like red dye allergies, like orally? Yeah. Food? I didn't even know that was a thing. The specifically red dye allergies? Yeah, there are a lot of people who are super allergic to, I forget what number it is, but like a very specific red oh, dye. Oh, right, right. Like the kind that they use in Swedish fish. Yes. Oh. Hmm. Yeah. So is that like a similar thing or is it just... I honestly don't know. And it depends on the brand. It depends on the person. Generally, tattoos are less allergenic. Black ink, like no one is really allergic to that. That's carbon. So unless they're allergic to one of the like random other liquids in it um, Mm -hmm. to sort of make it into ink, then you're pretty safe on that. And usually it's just red. Sometimes people back in the day will be allergic to other colors, but, you know, inks are pretty standardized now. Still not FDA approved, which is a bummer. Mm. And the EU is actually banning, like, the primary green and primary blue temporarily. Is that the right decision or no? Unsure. Okay. But it's like the first time that ink in tattooing has been Mm. regulated because basically up until this point... I don't know if people were tattooed yeah, yeah, for yeah. them to actually care. The regulation thing is so interesting. Yeah. Like, it seems like a good idea in general, right? Yeah. I mean, I think about this a lot with, like, supplements and vitamins, which are very poorly regulated, right? Yeah. Like, you never know what's going into stuff half the time. So generally, I'm pro-regulation with this kind of stuff, but, you know, I don't know enough about it. I think it requires a sensitivity because, you know, even like with supplements, if you just start, you know, wildly regulating, you might be stamping down on like indigenous medicines or like Chinese medicines, stuff right. like that. Um, and you want to like be sensitive to all of that. But what I was going to say with the supplements, at the bare minimum, it should have the thing it says <gasps> right. it is. Yeah, That's yeah, yeah. really what I mean by regulation is totally. that it is doing what it's supposed to be doing. And then you can argue about what's safe and what's not and what should be sure. regulated. Yeah. But a wider problem with supplements is, you know, it says this is whatever, zinc, and it's not or something <laughs> like, you know. Your Alex Jones mega pills. Yeah, well, well, you you beat me to the Alex yeah, Jones yeah, yeah, joke. Yeah. <laughs> Does Joe Rogan have supplements yet? He must have. So he, that's got to be selling something horrible, right? Oh, my right? God. Yeah. Anyway, sorry, but I interrupted you. Oh, no, you're fine. Yeah, it's hard to say. Sometimes it can be hard to discern what is well-placed concern for how something is being done and just like outright rejection to change. Right. Because already all the ink companies are like coming up with alternatives to those inks. Of course, yeah. So usually with red, I will ask people to do a color test before we do anything major, unless they already have and some that red on. Try a little p- yeah. bit on their skin. I recommend everyone gets color tests. Most common is people with darker skin will do a color test, just because when a tattoo heals, it's underneath a layer of skin. Mm-hmm. So whatever you have is going to tint it, and so white people, it also tints it. Uh, you know, right. it's going to make all of your tattoos lighter. Your blacks aren't going to be as black. White or yellow or, you know, soft creams aren't going to show up on yeah. someone with really pale skin, but they might look great on someone with a medium tone, stuff mm-hmm. like that. But especially with red, that is more of like allergy test. Huh. Yeah, saw someone on TikTok with like a big belly blaster. Oh. Whole thing, you know, <laughs> just falls out. Oh, um, oh that poor person. Yeah, it's, it's a rough time. Ugh. So definitely be careful out there, kids with red tattoos. Yeah. Usually safe, but give a little test. Do you have a thing with people under 18? Like, do they need... Totally illegal. Totally illegal you, to t- tattoo in, anyone under 18. In California, totally illegal. No parent permission or anything. Wow. Um, and that's state by state, though. Yeah. So tattoo regulations are county by county. No, there, really? There are almost... I don't think huh. there are state regulations for any state. There's no federal regulation. There's no national regulation. It's Wild. county by county. That's really interesting. So like in D.C., to get a tattoo license like in the D.C. vicinity, you had to have like a 500-hour apprenticeship or like written like recommendation from a tattoo artist that was already established, stuff like that. But then literally in Maryland... Um, <laughs> in Montgomery County, zero regulation. Yep. No regulation for tattoos. And then you jump up to Baltimore and it's another thing. So yeah. California is pretty lax. You need to take a bloodborne pathogen training test, which is like 
35 Seems bucks, like a good idea. Yeah. yeah. Shouts out Kathy Monty. What's up, Kathy Monty? Gave me my, uh, my Bloodborne Pathogen Training Certificate. It's just a lot of stuff about like the different diseases you can get from people's blood. Good. And you should know that yeah, before you start fun. messing around with sticking needles to people yeah. for sure. Yeah. Um, which there's even free ones. I do recommend a lot of people take a free one, mm-hmm. um, even if they're dabbling. I don't recommend people dabble, but if you do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What, what are the hazards of dabbling? I know that's a big thing. Yeah. By dabbling, you mean these are people who dabble in giving tattoos? Yeah. Okay. My thought on it is harm reduction there's definitely a big um thought in the community of just like you should never tattoo unless you have apprenticeship because it's a big apprenticeship system but that perpetuates a lot of problems of just who gets to tattoo who has access to it and so you know i'm a self-taught tattooer did you start it on yourself question i started on myself and i started on my on my roommates with like sewing needles in india ink um Mm. which you know was not safe I should have done more research. I was 19. But it was harder to find the necessary safety things back then. And there are a lot of online tattoo shops that will require you to prove that you are a professional artist with your license or like your shop or something like that. But now there's a lot of stuff that you can find. Never buy anything off Amazon, please. It's Half of it's fake. Yeah. I hate Amazon. Alibaba, much better. Alibaba, <laughs> AliExpress. Get it from there. Um, no, Wish.com. Wish.com tattoo supplies. But you'll get stuff from Amazon that's like, fine, fine, fine print, not for use on skin or stuff like that. Right, of course, Like weird, like lead metals and stuff you wouldn't quite expect. But definitely like, you know, people are going to do it, you know? There's 16-year-olds out there tattooing themselves and I think just pretending that it's not happening is bad. And yet, sure, a lot of them are going to ignore the safety protocols, but I'm sure there's a lot more that are like, I wish I could do this right. I really want to do it. That's right. do it. It's like fucking abstinence-only education. It's like people can do it, teach them how to do it right. Yeah. Or safely, really, yeah. is what I mean. So. Yeah, I, th- I think for the longest time, my only like awareness of stick and pokes were the, the girls in my school who would like <laughs> break open a ballpoint pen and then yeah. give like oh, a little yeah. like oh yeah 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 woof. That's kind of why seems very safe. <laughs> <laughs> that is the perception that people have of hand po tattoos, which is kind of why, as a larger whole, the industry has shifted to hand poke rather than stick and poke because that's the image that it conjures is a 16 year old with a ballpoint pen and you know I have a lot of people come in with the perception that it's going to hurt more or that it's going to not last as long or stuff like that so I did a poll and like 70% of people said it hurts less Um, that's interesting I I didn't realize when I got mine that the artist had started and was like midway through. Really? Yeah. Yeah. I did not feel it. Whereas like this one, which was a machine, I felt that one. Mm-hmm. Those are two vastly different spots as well. So any mm. like the, the forearm. This is way more bony, right? This is really bony. There's not as much fat. It's, yeah. There's thinner skin, stuff like that. Um, and also just things on the back. I have a bunch of theories about pain and tattooing. Mm-hmm. But please, 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 please. <laughs> there's not really a consistent like legend for why each part of the body hurts more people would be like oh bony spots hurt more but like honestly like fingers aren't like that bad but stomach so many tattoo artists will say the stomach and like back your calves are the most painful spots really? when you get tattooed huh. yeah i have this theory that it's like where your body is protective of and so we are Ooh. sort of more attuned to feel pain in those areas so mm-hmm. stomach like under your ribs is gonna be more protective so we're like we got to be aware if something touches that i think we also have more sensitivity to our backs mm-hmm. because we need to be aware of like what's behind what us. The fuck we can is going see on back what's there, going yeah. on in front of us, but we can't behind. So a lot of the time things on the back of your skin or different body parts will hurt a little more. What about skull? Like, you know, oof, that, that's extremely painful, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's like the thinnest there's no insulation up there. And and again, your body's really protective of the head. Yeah. So I'm sure it's like that like fight or flight response of like something's wrong. And so then we, yeah. with a tattoo machine, especially oh, we gotta go into like types of tattoo machines, especially with a coil, <laughs> which is the old school loud version, which is uh-huh. an electromagnet pounding into your skin, mm. which are theoretically gentler, but sound can amplify pain. That vibrating your skull while you're receiving pain and Oof, all that stuff. Oh right. baby. Yeah, uh-uh. that sounds awful. Yeah. Especially like face. Yeah. Oh, it seems anything incredibly near the pink. eye, I would just be like, yeah. no, People get their eyelids no tattooed. Oh, God, how? There's even like ink injections you can do oh, into the whites yeah. of your eyes. Yeah, that's a hard pass for me. <laughs> oh, just, my God. You don't want to go hard into body mods, get some like injections you, know, so you get little horns? You know, I was 46, it seems like a good time to do it. Yeah, right? well, yeah. we've been planning your back piece. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think Brian should split his tongue. 
Yeah, why not? Uh, Seems easy. Brian splits his tongue at 666. <laughs> yep, it's good. I can yeah. play two saxophones oh at the my same God. time. <laughs> oh, dear God. <laughs> Some uh, people just do that anyway, though. <laughs> Rosario and Kirk. But... You can get oral cancer from two different vaginas. <laughs> Hell yeah. That's right. You can do a double Douglas. <laughs> that, that, that sex, so see. Yeah. <laughs> oh, God. You know a lot more about the history and like yeah. lineage of styles of tattooing and like yeah. cultures of tattooing. Will you talk about that? I'm not smart enough about it to have like specific well, questions. Let me ask my specific question would be what tradition, if any, do you see yourself as a part of in the history of tattooing other than the stick and poke? Yeah. So, which I assume there's a bunch of different types artistically in that, yeah. of course. That's a technique, not a yeah. artistic style. Yeah. So I think I see myself as part of this new wave of queer self-taught tattoo artists. So pretty much until the internet existed, the only way to become a tattoo artist was, the primary way, was you go to a shop, you get tattooed there a lot, and eventually you annoy the artist enough that they take you on as an apprentice. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the time, you know, tattoo shops are awful. You know, yes. you're being verbally abused. You have to be tough enough to get it, stuff yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah. Not all of them, of course, but those tropes exist for a reason. And so that heavily bars anyone else from learning how to do it except mm -hmm. for white men. And a lot of the time, these people weren't like artists to start off with. Like there's these vice documentaries about different tattoo artists. And they're like, yeah, the first time he picked up a pencil, I was 26 walking in the Sully's tattoo <laughs> shop. And I learned he made me trace the boobies on the, the porno <laughs> magazines. Um, and it's like ridiculous. It has been like trade work where it's like you're working from Flash, which uh -huh. is the pre-drawn designs, stuff like that. But with the internet and with Instagram and being findable, because before... If you just put out a newspaper ad and you're like, I got a tattoo shop. Yeah, good luck. You're not going to get any clients and you're going to come and get your legs broken in. Right. Like there is a long history of tattoo shops being like, you're on my turf. I'm going to break your windows until Whoa. you can't afford to fix them anymore. Yeah. Wild stuff. But now with Instagram, you can get a following without having to be connected to one of these shops and you can gain knowledge from the internet on how mm -hmm. to be safe and how to be reputable and how to be good. And so that is a definitively new part of tattoo history. And that opens it up to tons of different people, people of color, trans people, queer people who just either didn't have access to any of that or were too scared, mm -hmm. you know, right? You, of course. you gotta go and get tattooed. And it's also hard when you don't want any of the tattoos that are being offered. Yeah, right. And you're talking about like people who are not artists going into tattooing, whereas you are like very well trained and a very talented artist with right. great taste going into well, doing it. You. So of course your tattoos are good. Yeah. Again, them not being artists wasn't everyone, but you know, it was trade work for, mm -hmm. for a long mm -hmm. time. And then every once in a while, someone would come along and sort of inject some new life into it. And then they would start doing a new thing. And then it would be that thing. But now it's like booming with all of this different stuff and all of these different styles and all of these artists going into tattooing directly from fine art or illustration, stuff like that. So yeah. that's definitely which part I am in. 15 years ago, I'd never heard anyone say, oh, I'm traveling to blah, 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 just to get a tattoo from this person. And now I feel like I know... 20 people who have destination vacations just to go get tattooed. Yeah. Vacation maybe is not the right word, but like take a trip. I have a friend who goes to Amsterdam regularly just to see this one artist and he's been Ooh. going for like 10 years and he yeah. just keeps adding to this piece on himself. Yeah. Yeah. I was working at Sang Blue downtown, which is a tattoo shop, and mm -hmm. Maxime there, who was a uh, really incredible Swiss artist, has people from like Europe coming to see him all the time, yeah. and they're getting like huge bodysuits, and like wow. they're like, oh, we've been working on this dude's tattoos for fifteen years, and yeah. it's wild. But yeah, like now you don't have to like buy a tattoo magazine and like right. search up people to find them. You can like just be like, wow, this person is in Vancouver and they do great work. And I'm going to save up, you know, a thousand bucks and go and see them mm -hmm. um, and get a, the tattoo of my dreams. <laughs> yeah. I love that. That's yeah. so great. Who are some artists that you would recommend following on Instagram or anywhere else? Like who are you, who are you really into right now? Oh gosh. So one of my favorites is Honey Basil, who is in Montreal, I think who does great neo-traditional work. Neo-traditional refers to 
the color and line work. Traditional tattooing is like American traditional, so very bold, very bright colors, mostly primary colors with mm-hmm. some greens and some browns. Neo traditional is honestly at this point so wide that it's barely a, <laughs> a title for anything, but still a focus on line work. But Honey Basil does these incredibly soft, neutral tones for these really naturalistic things and does just really creative hatching methods inside that. So like little lines. Honey Basil's great. Gossamer, New York, Grelizian, G-R-E-L-Y-S-I-A-N, is an amazing hand poke artist who does really cool stuff. Yeah, what about other people that you have gotten tattoos from? Because you have a lot of very cool tattoos. (laughs) Thank you. Oh, uh, Tender Brussels Sprout, Dane, who is here in LA, is a terrific artist who does these like very cartoony, colorful things. And Lou Wallstad is another terrific artist who is a friend of mine who does like these little decorative things of like little fairies and cherubs and dragons that are all wiggly and stuff. It's terrific. Who did this awesome little arch right here? Oh, that is my friend Rick over at Rodeo Tattoo Co. Is that hand poked? No, this is fine line. I think he was using a bug pin type three, which is like almost the size of a single needle. Very like building up your strokes and, and all of that. I think this was, you know, maybe the second one of this style. He is somewhat newer to tattooing, but he's terrific. Bossa Tattoo, B-O-S-S-A dot tattoo. Really incredible. And so sweet. Such a sweet guy. Are you freehanding stuff or are you putting a little little thingy down? Uh, I don't know what you call those. Stencils. Stencils. So a stencil is, usually it's purple just because that shows up best on the skin without being black so that you can still see what you've done. Mm -hmm. And it's like, just like a dye, I guess. It's a type of ink and you moisten it and so it releases from the paper that it's on and then sticks onto your skin and then you let that dry Mm -hmm. and then you tattoo over that. So I do most of my drawing digitally and then I have a little like brother stencil printer so I just like send it right from my phone. I just transfer it to my phone and send it there and I can resize it and all sorts of stuff. So I always wondered how that That's interesting, yeah. Yeah. A lot of older tattooers will freehand stuff and so the traditional way to do that is with Sharpies. So you build up, you start with yellow and you can barely see it and then you go to orange and mm-hmm. then you build it up. And by the time you do like red and then green, where you put the green, it's going to be like totally black. So you sort of sculpt the thing into existence. So huh. Stab D is doing a lot of freehand stuff like that, who's a really cool self-taught artist. So freehanding, I don't freehand much. And freehanding does not refer to the machine. It's just the drawing on the thing and then you go in with the machine. Tattooing is a slow process, almost always. You would imagine that hand pokes would take like a very, very, very long time. How would you compare it to like a machine? It depends on what you're doing. And so fairly simple line work without like a lot of like line weight variation and stuff like that and minimal shading. It's going to be slower, but it's not going to be that much slower. It's once you get into like the more complex stuff, like, you know, really filling in color, especially tough spaces. So like the back has really tough skin or the stomach has really tough skin or like the ribs is just like hard to stretch and the machine is a lot punchier Mm -hmm. and so you can go into those spaces a lot easier but with hand poke it can be a lot harder where you're like just not going deep enough yeah so it depends on what you're doing and where you're doing it but it can be twice as long or it can be like maybe an extra half hour or something like that you Mm. know a lot of my pieces are taking like three hours do you know how long it's going to take before you start vaguely these pieces on my page took between like two and five hours. And so that's the range. There you go. I also, I am a big proponent of accessibility. And Mm -hmm. I think that cost is a big part of why tattoos can be inaccessible. Yeah, for sure. And I think that being outside of a shop and being a trans person that other trans people want to go to, to feel safe with. For sure. I definitely want to be accessible to those people. Because, you know, I want them to feel comfortable. I want them to feel at home. I want them to feel like their body is safe there. Mm -hmm, For sure. Yeah. That's wonderful. (laughs) Uh, I think this is a good time to move on to segments. Let's do some segments. Let's do some segments. So our first segment, Allison, this is our pop culture recommendation segment. Now, since you've heard basically every episode of the show, you know know what the segment is. You know what the segment is. I feel like I can do the segment. Why don't (laughs) you know what? I would love for you to do that. Why don't you introduce the segment. Please call it What's Poppers In. <laughs> so this segment is called BLB Poppersing, where we do poppers. No. Um, but my favorite part of the segment is that I made a really lovely song oh, wow. for this segment. Oh, I'm so excited. 
And I know that you're a musician. I am a musician. And I, I'm, I'm new. I'm dabbling into music. I'm more of a visual person. Mm-hmm. But I was really excited to get to show you some of my step into your world. Mm-hmm. And so I think there's a lot of connections to a lot of what you are interested in, the uh, yacht rock, mm-hmm, as you mm-hmm. call it, that I tried to pull in to this music that I have made for you. And so, do you like music, Brian? I do. I love music. Yes, <laughs> That's thank great. you for asking. I'm so glad that you like music because I love music. I don't know anything about it. So we really won it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I hope that you like what I've made for you. Thank you. <laughs> Here's that beautiful theme song. What's poppin'? What's poppin'? And that was the theme song Great. of What's Poppers. Uh, how, how was that? I <laughs> loved it. A, a total masterpiece. You know, 10 Thank out you. of 10. A Thank plus, you. plus, 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 plus. Would buy again. I think that the um, fart pre-gen on the uh, keyboard really brought it home for me. Well, that's, you have to do that. Yeah. Like, I mean, that's why it's called music. It's not Beethoven unless it's played on farts. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've never heard of Beethoven's Fart the Symphony? <laughs> it's James Joyce's favorite. <laughs> yeah. That was perfect. That immediately enters the echelon of favorite What's Poppins. I agree. I thought that was stellar. I'm thrilled. I don't, I'm, I'm not sure anybody thrilled. else has beat Brian in his own game other than Ross, who just got up and left. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's I, a good I move. spent many hours in the shower thinking about it. So, Well, you crushed it. Amazing. Congratulations. Brian, What's Poppins? What's Poppins? Thank what's... you for asking. What's Poppins for me this week is a, it's a new series on HBO that's just in its second episode right now. It's called Somebody Somewhere, and it stars, don't think it was created by, but it stars Bridget Everett, God, I hope I'm getting her name right, who is a comic and cabaret performer, and she plays a woman that kind of goes back to her hometown in Kansas, and she's like late 40s, and her sister has recently died, although I'm not sure of what, but presumably cancer, and she kind of finds this group of like alt I think it's Manhattan, Kansas. So she gets into what they call choir practice, which is basically a cabaret show at a local church in a strip mall, which is where all the queer people in town hang out. (gasps) And you just smile the whole time watching this thing. She has just the most adorable relationships with these friends, many of whom she went to high school with and is now like reconnecting with. It's a small show. It takes place in a small place and it's about relationships between people in such a beautiful and fun way. The acting's great. The writing's great. It's an interesting setting. Rachel and I watched the first two episodes and we were just, we're in love with it. I think it's so smart and touching and funny and warm. I can't recommend it highly enough. Now, watch in episode three when it completely shits the bed <laughs> and everyone's like, you recommended what? But so far, the first two episodes have really been really wonderful. So. Yeah, after we talked about the show, I realized that I know her from, I used to watch the Bridesmaids bloopers. I don't even like the movie Bridesmaids that much, but I, the bloopers are really funny. I just enjoy bloopers. <laughs> I like watching people laugh. That's such a specific thing. <laughs> yeah. Was oh, she in that? I forgot she was in that. Yeah, very briefly, but like she's just kind of riffing and everyone's losing their minds and can't keep it together. Yeah. In this role, like it's a pretty non-comedic role. I mean, she has moments, but she's just acting, acting. And she's great. I think she's amazing. I didn't remember seeing her in anything before. So the whole thing is just kind of like, a, oh, my God, we're, there's a whole bunch of new people I didn't know about. So I that's that. what's popping for me. Yeah. Allison, what's popping? What's popping for me is, weirdly, a Twitch streamer. Okay, great. <laughs> His name is Northern Lion. He's a Canadian dad. Wait, um, I know a Canadian lion. <laughs> <laughs> we both know a Canadian lion. Yeah. Oh. Who's the Canadian lion? Commander Meowch from oh, Twerp. Oh, different lion. Different lion, yeah. Northern Lion is a Twitch streamer, and he's such a dad, and he treats Twitch streaming as such a job. <laughs> um, <laughs> and he makes fun of all the Gen Zers who are doing Twitch, and they're like, they're putting their hearts in it. I'm like, man, you just got to step back from it. <laughs> I love it. Yes, that's the attitude. Yeah. That's like the Willem Dafoe workman's attitude of like, I don't know, it's just a movie. I don't need to do that. Yeah, that's the, uh, fuck, what's his name? Mads Mikkelsen too, right? Oh, yeah. I treat everything like it's just the next big thing. Like it's, it's yeah. yeah. And he just shows up. He's like, Marvel? Yeah, okay, I guess. <laughs> I guess. Oh, yeah. so are people into that? Sure, fuck, fine, What, fine. bitch better have my money? Yeah. 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 For sure. <laughs> anyway, I'll be the sorry, bitch. Please. 
he's really funny in a surprising way most of the time, and he's really dry. Like, example, is the Twitch released all of the money that the top... Yes, it was, it was a uh, hack, right? Yeah. Oh, I forget if it was hacked and then they just released it outright oh, or something. They, I, okay, I forget. Yeah. But um, And it was like the top 100 Twitch, yes, I, the Twitch streamers. I remember I saw that this happened. And he is the top 101st Twitch streamer. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> and so he's just going off of like, oh, that top 100. You know, they don't know what's going on with the little <laughs> so people. <funny. laughs> you just go. But he's so funny. He's got like a one-year-old kid. And there's definitely a shift of like what he's like gone into. I used to watch him a while yeah. ago and got back into him, but he's really funny. And he, he's a gaming gaming streamer or what? He, he's a gaming streamer, but he specifically chooses games where he gets to be the star of the show. <laughs> like there's some really great clips of him just being like, this is not a two person show. You're the audience. We do a little riffing. But if you're trying to be the star, I got to I got to tell you, you got to go to the. <laughs> I love this guy. You know, <laughs> I love everything about what I'm hearing. Go to Hassan's stream and you can get harassed by him and then uh, <laughs> That's do the stuff. Fantastic. But, so he's like right now he's playing this like Canadian car building simulator where you're like a Canadian in the woods. It's called Mombazoo. Um, and you're just like <laughs> building a junk car and you have to go and drink maple syrup and eat poutine to <laughs> refill your meters. But wow. you have to do like, you have to shift in the car and like turn the car on and wow. put your blinker on and all of this like ridiculous stuff. And Fantastic. you have a, you have a sorry button, but he's just, he's hilarious. He's got like a photographic memory of everything. And so he'll just cool. go off on everything. Barely talks about the game. That rules. Yeah. That's the best kind of Twitch stream. That's what's popperizing for me. Layton. Uh, yes, Layton. What's popperizing? I'm so happy that you asked. Uh, you specifically asking. Um, <laughs> what's popping for me is I really like this true crime author, John Glatt or John Glott. I forget. I don't know how to say his last name because I'm just reading his books, but I've read like everything he's written because he's not even like a particularly great like prose writer, but he's written about all like very extensive histories of a lot of really big famous like more recent cases. And mm -hmm. he just came out with a book about uh, Lori Vallow and Chad Daybell. Do either of you know anything about no, this? not at all. Dear God, um, <laughs> it is a nightmare. She is like a doomsday prepper podcast person. Very, very religious. I'm going to get this wrong because I'm only midway into the book and I was so excited about it because I know nothing about this case. And there's stuff all online, but it's such a crazy story that like she was on Wheel of Fortune. She competed in like Miss Texas pageants, but basically she killed her two kids oh. um, and lied about it. Allegedly, and allegedly. <laughs> I mean, she totally did. Um, <laughs> Allegedly. <laughs> but um, it's this whole story where, like, her brother killed her ex-husband. Like, there's Allegedly. so many deaths involved. And I didn't realize this until I was reading the book. But her brother, who did that, was the shock jock radio DJ who did that very infamous hold your wee for a wee thing where the lady died of water intoxication. <gasps> Which I remember hearing about that story forever I don't ago. Remember this, but, but that sounds awful. Yeah, it was a contest of like, drink as much water as you can and don't piss, and you win a wee. What? Yeah, and so a wo oh the woman God. who came in second oh. place went home and died from water intoxication because oh that's a thing that can happen. And then he made the yeah. whole thing out to be like, I'm not at fault. And then he wrote a book, like a memoir called My Crazy Radio Life. And all this stuff. And then, like, Jesus she, Christ. He went and assaulted, like, like violently attacked with a taser, like, one of Lori Vallow's, like, five ex husbands. Like, I'm only midway through the book, but it's just such a wild story. And, like, John Glatt just very no frills lays it all out. So <laughs> that's what's popping. Doomsday Mother. Wow. Classic Layton. I can't cool. wait. Yeah. Classic I, I can't night. wait to yeah. get to the part yeah. where they talk about her doing a Doomsday Prepper, like, end of times podcast, because that's so wild. Yeah. So, yeah. Also, cool. there's like some of her interrogations online. Like, it's just, I love finding a hole. I, uh, I love finding. Oh, no, sorry, a can we get that clean? No, I love finding a just true, real quick, a true just crime the, rabbit hole. Real I've absolutely said I love finding a hole on this yeah, podcast before. So, if you want it. it, you can go get it. Um, <laughs> so, that's what's popping for me. Great. And now we're on our final segment, which is called Peaches and Lemons, where we say three good, cool things and one thing that's a mild bummer in the theme song. Goes here. I'm gonna burp. Peaches and lemons. Peaches and lemons. That's the, that was the theme song. <laughs> <laughs> 
Somebody else go first. Oh, I, I definitely think. have a lemon because I'm looking at it right now. Oh, boy. Why can I not hear this mic in my headphones? Why can I not hear this mic in my headphones? I can't figure it the fuck out. So you've been hearing me and you, and you've only been hearing out of an ear. That's why I have this off, because I can't figure out how to get this fucking audio. It's a idiosyncrasy of the thing I rigged up here, and Jarek helped me solve it, and then I switched computers, and now I don't know what the solution is, and it's like, it's just driving me nuts. Why can't I hear this mic? I understand why I can hear these two mics. It's not interesting, but <laughs> I would, all I want to be able to do is hear everybody through these headphones without any latency. That's the fucking key. I forgot to say that. Latency night. Yeah. Latency <laughs> night. With Brian Weck. Yeah. Or it should be latency night with Brian, Brian Weck, Weck. Right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah, me. thank you. <laughs> That's the real uh, uh, BBLB corn. Yes. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, it's just like, it's one of these dumb audio things where I'm like, if I had the right setup, it would be easy. But it's because I have a mixer aggregated to this Apollo. Oh, it's just annoying. And it's because I don't want to spend, if I bought a four channel thing, those are like $2,000. It's not worth it. I have the gear here and I just can't hear this mic. Anyway, that's my one. Tragic. Yeah. Oh, I know. The other night, I was on a call and I was just talking about like, uh, you know, how I've progressed as a person and a thing that used to really bother me no longer bothers me. I go to sleep, have a fucking nightmare about the exact thing. And then also <laughs> all my teeth are falling out. Oh, no. I think my lemon is just how realistic it feels when your teeth are falling out in a dream. Like, why does my brain know what that feels like so yeah. acutely? Because I guess you went through it once. That's true. Yeah. And then I've also, I did like a stupid special effects test because I bought a box of fake teeth. Long story. Um, <laughs> I bought a box of fake teeth and I thought it would be a really cool horror thing if I put like 130 teeth in my mouth and then put fake blood in it and then like slowly incrementally spat it in, into a sink. So I like do one and two and then like all of them. <laughs> but I ruined it because I started freaking out because they were going down the drain. Oh my God. Um, but doing that was like, oh my God, my dreams are so fucking accurate of when your teeth fall out. Like that's 100% what it feels like. That rules. So that's my lemon. Great. My lemon, it's a very small one. Okay. Um, that's good. But it's the widespread supply chain issues in oh the global God. trade. <laughs> yeah. Um, but there's one brand of tattoo needle that I like. It's from Tatsoul. It's their Envy brand tattoo needle. And they never have the size that I use. And so I've had to go on this massive journey oh of buying different tattoo needles. And they come in a box of 50. I'm not going through that, like, Ooh. quickly. And, you know. And it's expensive, I would imagine. And it's expensive. And I go for the cheap ones because I'm like, it can't be that much worse. And it is worse. And I go for the expensive ones. And I'm like, it should be good. They're expensive and they're just as bad. And I just want this one brand. And they're never in stock. So I've gone on this yeah. whole circle. I've gotten, like, six different brands. None of them are as good. Oh, that's so Such frustrating. What, what makes the big difference of like a needle feeling good to you? It's a couple of things. A needle is made out of two parts. There's like the part with the eye on it and the bottom, the long bar. Wait, the eye? Where, where you like on the a traditional machine. Goes through, right? Where oh. you where you like put it on the nipple. Uh, it's called a nipple. Oh, is that a different thing than Hell what yeah. I said? Yeah. Tattoo needles are long. And then there's a loop at the end where you put it on the nipple and that's what oh, drives yeah. it up okay, and down. Yeah, cool. But then there's a shorter part where all the needles are soldered on and then you sort of solder oh. those two together. Oh, yeah. So on the really expensive ones that I have, the part at the bottom wiggles. It's not strong enough. Oh, that's frustrating. And it's they changed the supplier. It, was, it used to be good, but now they're not. <laughs> it's been like, it's like this with every fucking yeah. thing now. It's like, oh, I like that thing. Well, fuck you. You can't get it. We went to Best Buy and I couldn't find a oh. micro USB cord. Oh, yeah, we yeah. really did wander around. By the way, I think I have nine of them in there oh, if you want one. I already got them from okay. Amazon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, the global supply chain issues yep, are my very minor annoying. lemon. Yeah. Yeah, it's a bummer. Peach time. Peaches. Brian, what's peaching? <laughs> what's peaching for me? <laughs> Peach number one is that, well, of course, you two are here today, which means that Leighton brought a very special gift for my daughter, which was a Christmas gift that I knew about, very but we haven't seen each other in person in uh, since Thanksgiving, I guess would be the last time. Yeah. And you brought it over and she lost her mind. How would you describe it? I got a custom glittery pink chess set for Audrey that also came with checkers pieces. Yep. And it is the most 
obscenely glittery thing I have ever seen in my life. So obviously it is perfect an for a seven-year-old. Yes. And I also, I ran out of wrapping paper, and so I bought pink princess wrapping paper because it was all that they had. Oh, but... And so everyone Perfect. else got <laughs> gifts wrapped in princess wrapping paper. It's great. But it was for us. She loved it. So that's peach number one. Thank you for that. I can't wait to play chess with her on it. I mean, this was also going to be one of my peaches. I actually wrote down in my peach list, Audrey TBD. <laughs> <laughs> I just like knew that would be one of yeah. them. Well, and I don't know if this made it into the rest of the episode, but when we came in here, Rachel texted me a quote from Audrey, which was, I like having grown up friends because they buy me stuff. So. <laughs> That's how you know you did it right. Yeah. But she immediately started setting up the pieces in yeah, she the can correct. Just do it. it was absurd because when I got it, I wanted to set it up so I could take a nice picture. And I've only ever played chess online. And so I was like struggling and had to look at a thing. But nope. She, and, then she, and then she took one of the checkers and <laughs> put <laughs> the pieces on. And it was like, yeah, I'm going to move around on the check. Yeah, I'm going to slide around on my new toy. God bless. So yes, thank you for that. Yeah, of course. Uh, Peach 2 is, I actually kind of talked about this last week. I had an eye doctor appointment yesterday. And oddly, my prescription, <laughs> I don't think this is the first time this has ever happened, didn't change. I have terrible vision. I'm minus 16 in both eyes. So I've found great contacts. I'm 20-20 with them in, but- It's 2022. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much. I appreciate, I appreciate you and I appreciate that comment. If you get to uh, negative 20, negative 20, do you just loop around and you're back to perfect? Wow. Oh yeah. I wonder. The answer is no. The, uh, <laughs> but anyway, I was like, oh my God, my prescription didn't change and we could order more contacts and there are no supply chain issues with those. Oh. I just get them. I just get them right away. And, uh, my final peach is I had an amazingly productive day today. It was just like, I wrote down the list. I was in here at 8 a.m. just checking shit off. That's why I said comments on the last episode. That email came out at like 9 or whatever I sent oh, it. I was really sweating because I was like, oh, no, I fucked up. I woke up early this morning and I was just on Reddit and playing Civ. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I just like almost everything I needed to do today. I got done. Bam, 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 including setting this stuff up, which, as I mentioned to you both before, it just worked the first time. Also because Jarek taught me how to do it when yes. he helped me last time. So them's my peaches. Them's your peaches. I got mine. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. What are your peaches? Peach number one. This is a fun video game one. But my friend Charlie set up a Minecraft server. And oh. I have been playing Minecraft wow. with a bunch of animators. Nice. I feel like people are kind of getting back into Minecraft these days, right? I know other people doing this. It's very robust. And for a bunch of artists, I didn't give credit for how creative Minecraft is. Yeah. And I think the perception is that it's a, you know, bunch of kids playing video games. But right. it's basically a creativity engine, right? Yeah. And there's game elements, the adventure elements of it. Yeah. But um it's been really nice to have this like super passive creative aspect and like playing it with other people and being like, oh I made this thing. And they're like, wow, that's so cool. And I make like kelp farms for people and they're like, oh wow, thanks for doing that. That's it's so great. great. And the music's um, calming, right? It, it's yep. really good music. And we put some mods in it. It's just it's a really fun time. And I feel like Do you have mods? drawing is easier. <laughs> like because I have this like passive That's like so coal of creativity burning. Yeah. yeah. Do you have mod recommendations for Minecraft? We only have two. We have Biomes of Plenty, which is just adds more biomes and they're really cool. And then we have Aquaculture 2, which just expands the fishing a little bit. So we wanted to go pretty simple, but it's very nice. Cool. Huh. Peach number two. I finally bullied Layton into letting me come on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> or you ran out of enough people and uh, dragged me on here. <laughs> no, she's been but she's been talking about you for I mean, since we started. Oh, my friend Allison rules, we gotta have her on. <laughs> and then when we were just talking about upcoming guests, it was like, Okay, let's do it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm glad you're here. Thank you for being here. Oh, thank you for having me. I had a lovely time. Which sort of leads into my third peach, which is that this almost had to be delayed because I'm going to Austin for a guest spot at a cool tattoo shop there. Oh, wow. Um, which they reached out to me and it was very cool wow. and I felt very special. I was like, oh my That's God. That's so great. And so it was very validating. I'm excited to go to Austin. I'm excited for all the cool tattoos I'm going to do. I love and that. I'm going to do a trade with another queer artist there and it's going to be great. That's so great. Are you a barbecue person? I do eat meat, and I'm excited for some Texas barbecue. I hear the breakfast tacos in Austin is a thing. It is, and you can get a version of those at Home State here, oh. too. Mm -hmm. But yes, definitely get breakfast tacos. I have a couple 
I like what is it? Black's barbecue mm. is really good. Um, I mean, everyone there has their barbecue recommendations, but yeah, the barbecue is fucking unreal. I'm, I'm excited. There, it's so good. It's, it's a great city. Yeah. Get some frisky brisket. Frisky yes. brisket. I'll get a frisky with that. They have brisket. a local grocery store uh, called Whole Foods <laughs> that you might want to you might want to check out. Is that H O L E? That's foods? correct. Yes. <laughs> Whole Foods. Yes. We were at Whole Foods. Can I show you a draft tweet from the Ninja Sex Party? Twitter drafts. Is this going to pass the Wechdel test? <laughs> it just says Whole Foods. <laughs> You're gonna get you would get a million people being like, "Oh, uh, is a donut a Whole Food?" Yeah, yeah, oh yeah. my god! It's been there for months, and I haven't quite pulled the trigger on it yet. But oh. <laughs> I wonder anyway, why. Yeah, wait. <laughs> my peaches are going to be really repetitive, but great. Whatever. This is what I planned on. Number one peach. Hold my hand. <laughs> You're here. I love you so much. It's gay. I'm so glad that you live in LA. You're so gay. I've been like, I, I got like very emotional multiple moments through this episode because I just like love you. Aww, so I love oh my god, I'm like getting. You're crying. Getting, no, I'm not. Aww, <laughs> anyway, I love you. I love you. Oh, honey. <laughs> <laughs> Whew. That never happens. Oh my God. My second peach is that, Brian, you just gave me a big hug mug, which <laughs> people on the video can there see. It is. That was your Christmas present, which has been here for <laughs> over a month now. Yeah, classic. Why am I getting emotional? Because <laughs> you have amazing fucking friends. Yeah, it's That's true. Why. It's true. Um, and then my third peach is just the Audrey thing. I love seeing Audrey. She gave me two big fat hugs, uh, and that kid hugs with her whole body. So. Oh, and it, it is Bam, like yeah, forceful. a full oh impact. So please let me know how hard she kicks your ass at sparkly chess, <laughs> glitter chess. Oh, I will. Yeah. yeah. So those are my peaches. Well, this was a fucking treat. So oh, yeah. thank this you so treat much for, me. for being thank here. Thank you. Awesome. We've already said it, but where can people find you? I When we do the social post, I want to post a bunch of pictures of your tattoos. That's so nice. Also, um, I want to post the picture that I took of you at Best Buy <laughs> by gamers <laughs> for gamers with your sick sunglasses. <laughs> You're a bunch of like high-tech sunglasses with a bunch of wires coming off of them. Very silly. They were like awesome. headphone sunglasses that play. Very cool. Absurd. I am local bird mom. No spaces, no periods or anything. Local bird bomb on Instagram. That's most of where I the stuff I do. Um, you can book a tattoo with me by DMing me there. I will be switching to a job form soon, but for the now time, so I'll do that. I'm also on Twitter. I don't really do a whole lot on Twitter. Local bird bomb or localbirdbomb.com. Very happy for getting that. Oh, yeah, well, send, very good. Yeah. yeah. Or you can send me an email at localbirdmom at gmail.com. Branding, baby. Wow, that's it. Got you em. did it. Also, I did some flash for you that you have done very oh wonderful tattoos. Yeah, I forgot to say, yeah, I've done, I've done a, a couple of pieces on listeners of the podcast. Yes, um, this is true. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. Oh. Um, most of them have actually been done on randos who are just like, this is sick flash. And I'm like, oh, do you know Layton? And they're like, who's that? And I'm like, hell yeah. Oh my God. I Which is that. like almost more validating because it's yeah. just like, Hell yeah. I love yeah, it. Yeah, and at some point in the future, whenever, we'll do some more of that. Yeah, I'm excited for that. Yeah, me too. I've got ideas. All right, well, that's our episode. That's our episode. It was a very fun one. I loved it. Uh, uh, what do we say at the end of this? I feel like we're, we're switching things up. What Stay you... safe, come hard. Yeah. <laughs> wow, okay. If you, if you could throw in your own catchphrase, what would it be? Oh, I like um, <sighs> That was it. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> Will you read your hat? Oh my god. Yeah, you're wearing your my favorite say? hat. My hat says Let's see it. It's cool that women like me, but it makes me sad that fish fear me. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the end of the podcast. Bye. Mwah. Bye. Bye everybody. Leighton Night is produced by Brian Wett, Leighton Gray, and Jarek Centeno. Follow us on Twitter at Leighton Night, on Instagram at Leighton underscore night, or email us at Leighton at gmail.com. <laughs>